Good evening. It's a pleasure being here with you, and especially being the last, I guess. Uh, redesigning life. In the first question, most of us ask, why redesign life? I mean, now, uh, what does it really take? But if you think about it, and if you've lived long enough, I guess uh, after a point in time, most of us have a certain expression on our face, if you've lived long enough. And that expression is something like this. For those of us who haven't had that expression yet, wait till you get married. <laughs> and uh, a confession, I had a very similar expression on my face a couple of years back. Maybe I still do to an extent. And, uh, and uh, what really caused this was uh, the life I was leading. And the life I was leading was, uh, by the way, uh, what I'll be sharing with you today is in two fronts. Uh, I work as an innovation consultant, and I also uh, decided at some point in time to move from consulting into practicing innovation. And the canvas I decided to practice on was my own life. So at some point in time, I decided to move. I'm going to share with you experiences that I've had in redesigning my own life. Uh, then I'll share some fascinating stuff, similar to that in my way, but that as good perhaps. Uh, also in a way that uh, working with different people and understanding from them what it takes to redesign life. And in my work as an innovation consultant, how do people make leapfrogs take place? We leapfrog at work, but what about our personal lives? So basically, uh, I had that expression on my face when I was working 25 days a month, about 18 hours a day, traveling 20 days a month. Uh, to the extent that uh, my daughter was calling my neighbor uncle, or rather, so they calling me uncle and my neighbor daddy. <laughs> and that's when I knew I had to quit and do something different. So I began to shift from there straight to working uh, currently four to six days a month. I earn twice as much now while working 25 days a month. I've diversified sources of income in a way, actively pursue interests, and uh, not a 20 year old with no responsibilities. So really, uh, when I say interests and my leisure, what's that been? It's been in terms of pursuing breakthroughs in physical conditioning in a way, in karate, in the martial arts. Uh, I pursue interests in uh, quantum physics and hypnotic trances. And I enable organizations that are creating a social impact. My bread and butter comes from those four to six days that I work with commercial organizations. And uh, with these organizations, uh, I get satisfaction and meaning, perhaps. So I work about seven, eight days with them in a month. Now the question is, uh, how did you get into the life you're currently leading? If you're like most of us, you did 12 years of schooling, uh, maybe three to four years of undergrad work, maybe three years of uh, postgrad or two years of postgrad, and then you joined an organization and then you worked not less than nine hours a day. You worked maybe what, 18, 17, 16 hours a day, maybe eight days a week. And at some point in time, you had that expression on your face. Where did I reach now? What am I doing now? How did I get into this life? Have you experienced that? Yeah. <laughs> so really, uh, what's causing this? If you think about it, we've inherited certain structures of our life from those who have gone before. I mean, from uh, the previous generations. Why 12 years of schooling? Why not six years? Why not 18 years? Why six years of schooling? Why three years or four years of undergrad work? Why not one year? Why not two years? There are structures that we've inherited from people who've gone before. And we live our life on those structures. But more importantly, we've also inherited mindsets. As Inaz was saying about the mind, we've also inherited mindsets that limit us in a way. And one of the biggest limiters of, uh, of, of where we are currently is the reality that uh, we live in a very physical world. And uh, being in a physical world, the laws of physics seem to apply, and we extrapolate those laws of physics into the performance world, and that's a mistake. So for instance, what do I mean by that? In physics, in physics, you can't get from, can you hear me? Oh, is that on? Yeah. You can't get from, in physics, you can't get from point A to point B by disappearing over here, arriving over here. You have to move in. A1, A2, A3, A4, whether it's in the air medium or land medium or water medium, but you have to go incrementally to reach over there. Similarly in biology, you can't be born fully grown overnight, right? You have to be born first and then you become a baby and then, and then a toddler and then a preteen and a teen and so on and so forth. That's a reality. 
It applies in the physical world. It's extremely true, but it does not apply in the performance world. In the performance world, leap frogs apply. In the performance world, let me share with you an example. What does it take to leap frog? Uh, the Nick Basker newspaper group was born fully grown. Across the newspaper industry, the mindset and the belief is that it takes you five years to be a leader if you ever do become a leader. So you have to launch and you get advertisement revenue and you launch a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more. And if you ever do become a leader across the world, it takes you at least five years. But these guys said, let's be leaders from day one. People said, you're crazy, it can't be done. This is a newspaper industry. For the last 150 years, this is the way to do it. But they found a different way of doing it. They redesigned the process. They found a completely different way of doing it. And Ahmedabad, for instance, they had the single largest newspaper launch in history, anywhere in the world. 450,000 copies sold on the day of launch. A complete new world record. These guys are formidable. They've launched in 112 cities across India. Leaders from day one in 109 of them. So really, uh, linearity doesn't apply in the performance world. Leapfrogs apply. One more example, uh, that's the ending basket, by the way, and that's Ahmedabad launch. One more example is, uh, have you heard of MV Foundation? It's based out of Hyderabad. And uh, they have this mission of, uh, of uh, getting kids out of uh, bonded labor and into full-time schools. Now here's a question. A kid who's about 9, 10, 11, 12 years old, 13 years old, You've taken him out from bonded labor into full-time school. Which class do you put him into? He's never had a day of schooling in his life. Which class do you put him into? Uh, logically, the first standard, right? But these guys quit. I mean, they are these huge older kids, and you have these small little things running between their legs. They hate it. So they quit. So then thought was, you have to put them into age-appropriate classes. A 10-year-old must go to class 5, uh, 13 to class 8, but how do you do it? And MV Foundation came up with a fascinating idea called Bridge Camps. In just six months, in just six months, they ramp up these kids to perform at class 8 level or class 9 level, including teaching them to read and write with, uh, with, with, with recognition, with, with, uh, including the maths, including whatever it is, in just six months. And these kids don't perform at the best, they don't perform at the worst but middling levels. That tells you a lot, right, about all that we take for granted. I'm somebody I was speaking to said, you know, Porus, the whole intent of the school system is to get kids out of the parents' hair. <laughs> and uh, if in six months you can ramp up somebody to that fast, it tells you a great deal about what we can really do. So leapfrogs enable redesign. The first thing about leapfrog to redesign your life is to take on a leapfrog challenge, something that seems to be impossible. But sure, you're already working, what, 18 hours, 19 hours a day? What do you do next? How do you do that? Uh, it's not about working harder. Again, in the physical world, if you have a large body in front of you, a large weight in front of you to move it, you have to use greater effort. It's always more for more in the physical world, more effort, harder work. In the performance world, it doesn't apply. So it's really about from working harder to working differently. Uh, quick question. What does it take to run a Fortune 15 company with $120 billion in turnover, 200,000 employees across the world, one of the most respected organizations across the world? It takes a CEO, doesn't carry a mobile, and delegates to the point of abdication. If the CEO is such a slacker, the head office must be working overtime. The head office is all of 17 people who take up just one floor in nondescript building. And the organization and the person? Yes, Berkshire Hathaway and Warren e. Buffett. Uh, not more for more, but more from far less. And if he can do that, I'm sure we can do perhaps uh, a fraction of what he's doing and yet perform a great deal more. Not just in terms of time and effort, resources. Uh, Again, leapfrogs happen when you challenge resources. Now, uh, take, take Delhi police, Delhi traffic police. These are about 5,000 traffic policemen, and uh, they've got uh, a city of 12 lakh or 1.2 million to police, 6 lakh vehicles. What do they do? They use very futuristic crime-fighting tools. And what are the crime-fighting, futuristic crime-fighting tools? 
Facebook. They don't have the resources to put in cameras at every street corner. They don't have the resources to put in cameras at every street light. So what do they do? They say every citizen has a, has a, most citizens have a mobile phone with a camera. If you spot somebody breaking the rule, just snap it, take a photo, upload it to Facebook, and we'll take care of it from there. <laughs> at last count, nearly 5,000 chalans have been issued. Do, do Google it and check it out. At last count, nearly 5,000 chalans have been issued. They keep tracking what's been happening over there. And uh, they've got 10 people dedicated to this Facebook page. And it's, a, it's an investment that's completely worth making. They've completely changed the paradigm of policing. People in the US are using it, Australia are using it, UK are using it now. <laughs> so the question that you ask now is, sure, I freed up time and resources, but now I'm 40 years old, or 50 or 60 or whatever else it is, and I don't have the talent. What do I do? Because talent, again, in the performance world, and in the physical world, we believe is nature versus nurture, right? Either you have it or you don't. If you don't, quit. Get lost. But really, oh, that's a very talented guy. That's a, that's a, that's a picture of a, of a dragon slayer, a dragon fighter. And uh, he's been practicing very hard throughout the years. He's finally come to a level where he can slay some dragons. And here's a sweet old lady. who short-circuited the dragon. Really, if you look at it, process beats talent. Process beats talent. You've heard of the Fosbury flop? That uh, the high jump? Okay, Dick Fosbury was, uh, was a very untalented high jumper, but for whatever reason, he had this aspiration to go to the Olympics. Now, this guy had never crossed more than six feet, four and a half inches in his life in terms of jumping. And that time, the way of jumping was to straddle the bar like that and go over. He'd never crossed six feet, four and a half inches. The cutoff was seven feet to qualify for the Olympics. This was in the US. So what do you do? He tried working harder. He tried a lot of things. Didn't happen. So he found a different way of jumping. He ran up to the bar and jumped with his back to it. What you see over there. And uh, sure enough, he qualified for the Olympics within months. Uh, he went to 1968 Mexico Olympics. People were shocked to see this guy going like that. And uh, an Olympic record, a world record, and a gold medal. Seven feet, four and a quarter inches. And today, that the whole jump is named after him, Dick Fosbury. They've even got a coin after him. So if you jump in strange ways, you get coins made after you. <laughs> how many of you, I can't see too well, but how many of you can't draw or sketch for nuts? Yeah, that's it. You know, all it takes really is not talent, but this very interesting lady called uh, Betty Edwards, who's, who's discovered this drawing on the right side of the brain. Whenever you see a sketch or a diagram that you want to draw, just turn it upside down. That short circuits your brain's judgmental mind. Just draw the lines that you see, and it's fascinating what emerges. But I would recommend that you don't do it with people yet. So okay, maybe porous, great. I can be talented the radical process. But here's the reality. I don't have X, I don't have Y. And that's reality, right? You need to face reality. In the physical world, when a tiger is charging at you, that's reality. Everything else stops. In the performance world, it doesn't really apply. There are multiple realities. Which realities do you choose? I'll share one example. I'll share the second one over here. Uh, S. Narendran. He's a fascinating gentleman. Uh, when he started off uh, his career, this was with Apollo Tires. And he was this IIT grad, fresh out of college, and uh, working in sales and marketing with them. So one day he was driving, he was on his two-wheeler, going from Meerut to Delhi, and he had a major accident. And uh, when he woke up, he was in hospital, and uh, he, his right leg was amputated at the thigh. And there's this 22-year-old kid, and uh, waking up, it was a nightmare. And people would come in and tell him from Apollo Tires, uh, don't worry, uh, don't worry, you won't get into sales marketing, it's okay, we'll give you an HR job. Or we'll give you an admin job. Or we'll put you into, uh, into uh, what did he mention? One more, one more lame field, like perhaps uh, something else, whatever. So he was lying there thinking that, my God, my life is really over. These guys are giving me an HR job. This is terrible. 
And then his boss came in. His boss's name was Udyan Dravid. He came in, and he looked at this kid lying over there. He stood at him. This is what he says. He stood with him over there, stood over him, and said, look, I'm the head of marketing Apollo Tires. I grew the company from 50 crores to 400 crores, from a net loss of 17 crores to a net profit of 80 crores. And I've never, ever used my legs for that. <laughs> I've only used my head, so I don't know what difference this makes. And with that, he went away. And Narin says, I was so charged by that. I was so motivated by that. I mean, in two weeks, he was out of the hospital, on the field, going great guns. It was a transformative moment for him. And as he says, he ended up as, as head of marketing Apollo. He quit. He joined TVS Electronics, CEO of TVS Electronics. And now he has his own company doing very well for himself. But really, what he did was he brought in a deleted reality. And there are always deleted realities. We tend to focus on limiting realities, but we forget that the reality is never singular. There are numerous realities out there. Choose one that works for you. But the problem, Porus, is that the system sucks. The boss is a pain and the spouse is a... <clears throat> <laughs> sure, so what do you do? Again, in the physical world, it's about cause and effect. This is a problem, this is the cause. So this is the effect. Solve the cause. Solve the problem. It doesn't apply in the performance world because in the performance world there are numerous causes, there are numerous effects. It's a very complex system. So the only way that you have is to actually make a new right way. Don't worry about solving problems. Make them irrelevant. Typically, in, uh, if, if you've had a bad uh, time with your spouse and you go to marriage counseling and you come to somebody like me, they'll tell you that, uh, okay, the husband doesn't listen. Teach him listening skills. <laughs> the wife doesn't speak up. Teach her assertiveness skills. These guys don't talk. Teach them communication skills. And things go from bad to worse. But there's an interesting guy called Mott Fertil who's not a psychologist, but who went through a bad marriage and he discovered that you really can't fix uh, too many things that are wrong. There are numerous things in a marriage or in any complex relationship or in any complex system. All that you can do is make new things right. So don't solve things, make problems irrelevant. Uh, let me actually uh, share one more story with you from Shanta Sinha and, and child labor. Uh, tell me, why does child labor exist? What's the logical reason why are kids out of school and working? Because of poverty. And to uh, actually make sure kids go back to school, what do you have to do? Eliminate poverty. Right? Cause and effect. But uh, poverty is this huge animal that nobody can quite really eliminate. So what did this lady do? She said, always challenge cause and effect. So it's very interesting. In one mandal, this is near, I think, Rangareddy, she swept nearly a thousand kids into school, kids who were working. A thousand jobs were created which were filled by adults, their parents largely. So a thousand jobs at adult labor at adult wages, the whole economic profile began to go up. And then she said, very interesting, it's not poverty that causes lack of education. It's lack of education that causes poverty. Because you'll find that uh, there is an intergenerational cycle of poverty. And when you educate one child, it changes. So now completely reframed, it's been accepted across the world now. It's not poverty first, education second. It's education first, poverty second. And that's been transformative, really. So the whole movement of actually uh, first eliminate poverty, then get an education is again uh, a no-brainer. It's actually about education first, and then you tackle poverty in a way. But then sure, all that's fine, but one has to make compromises, be reasonable. After all, we live in a difficult world. It's a trade-off, right? In, in physics, uh, every action is an equal and opposite reaction. It's a trade-off. In biology, if the population of lions increases, the population of gazelles comes down. It's a trade-off. Not in the physical, not in the, not in the performance world. It's always about the and. I'll share one example with you, uh, Surat. You've heard of uh, S.R. Rao from Surat, the guy who cleaned up Surat? Right? Uh, this gentleman uh, had a problem. He wanted to clean up Surat, a very sweet chap. 
And uh, unfortunately, the counselors were against him. So whatever he did, they tried to neutralize what he did. So first thing that he said is, I'll, I'll, I'll find people for throwing garbage on the roads. And the counselors said, nothing doing. Finding is our prerogative, and we won't let you find. So what do you do? This guy said, OK, finding is your prerogative, fine. But uh, service charges are my prerogative. I'm cleaning, the, I'm cleaning the garbage two days, twice a day. If you're putting garbage on the road, it means you want extra service. And I can charge you for a service. So it wasn't a fine, it was a service charge. And the councillors couldn't do anything about that. Then he needed money to clean up the city. And property tax is what gives you money, right? In Surat, property tax is collected once in four years. And this guy, unfortunately, come in the middle of the period. So he had absolutely no money. So he said, let's make property tax every year. One fourth amount, but every year. What do you think the councillor said? No. Property tax is our prerogative. And we won't let you do that. So he said, sure, fine. What would most of us have done, I guess? So what he said was, fine, sure. That's your prerogative, no problem. He divided Surat into four zones. Zone one plays this year, zone two next year, zone three the third year, and zone four the fourth year. <laughs> no compromises, no trade-offs. And the biggest was perhaps his whole thing about uh, demolishing buildings. He began with demolishing the chief minister's son-in-law's building. <laughs> he has this crazy notion of uh, going after the biggest and most powerful first, because then everybody else falls in line. So he went after these guys, and uh, he made sure he wasn't in his office. He didn't stay at home. He couldn't be contacted on the phone. At any point in time, he kept moving around. And only could be he could be only contacted by walkie-talkie. And walkie-talkie being an official communication was always recorded. And he always made sure that there was press around him at all times. <laughs> and uh, so the moment he was, he was beginning to demolish a building, uh, He'd get a call from a minister or somebody on the walkie-talkie and put the volume on high and say, Sir, I can hear you loud and clear. There's a press with me. There are people with me. We can all hear you, sir. What can I do for you? Oh, what are you doing? I'm demolishing your building, sir. Oh, very good, very good. Make sure it comes on completely. <laughs> what else is he going to say? <laughs> so really, it's no compromises. It's really about and doing what you really want to go after. So really, if you look at it, physical laws of linearity, the performance impact is incrementalism, hard work and effort, the impact is life imbalance and inefficiency. You're already working pretty hard. You don't want to work any harder. Cause and effect, it's about problem solving mode, fixititis, nature versus nature, or talent. It's about the less talented dropping out. Uh, Trade-off is compromise, life imbalance again. And really, uh, to life, to, to redesign life, move to leapfrog from linearity. Take on non-linear challenges. Not hard work and effort, but more with less. Less effort, far less effort. Lazy people work hard. Because they don't take the time to think differently. <laughs> Cause and effect, don't fix the problem, make it irrelevant. Process beats talent, and, 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 and grandmothers can teach you a thing or two. And not either or, but and. So how do you actually begin to redesign the first steps? Change the metaphors that you're using. Very often we use the metaphors of the physical world. You can't run before you learn to walk. Not really. It's true in the physical world, not true in the performance world. Work at most three days a week. <laughs> Spend two days a week deepening relationships with friends and family, creating quality time, not just hanging around. Two days a week actively pursuing things that you've always wanted to do. And not just pursuing them, but becoming competition standard from them. By the way, uh, how many over 50s over here? OK, great. Now, there is one sport where you can always beat the younger crowd. And that's ultra marathon running. The moment you cross 100 kilometers, the old and the women seem to do far better than the men. And the younger the man, the worse he fares. So if you want to actually become competition standard, that's one sport you can take off. And that's what I'm training for next also. Uh, don't accept a dip in income, by the way. It's not a trade-off. Instead, go for more. Work three days a week and go for more income. Take that first step now, ladies and gentlemen. It's far easier than we imagine.
Thanks. <laughs>